Welcome to Don't Get Rusty, where we have fun chatting about things that will help keep you proficient. I'm Keith West, and today our webinar is Plan of a Scan, where to look for smoother and safer flying. We're joined today by a panel of experts who will help you develop a VFR scan. We're gonna jump right into introductions, but if you will give me 60 seconds, I will go over how the webinar will work and how you can interact with our panelists. One other thing, this webinar is being recorded. So about six hours after the webinar closes down, you'll receive an email with a link to a recording that you can watch at your leisure. Okay, let's get started. Now, if you are looking at this on a PC, a, a desktop computer, your uh, presentation should look something like this. If you're only seeing the little tab on the left, it means that you are minimized. And if you click on the white arrow in the orange box, you can see the full panel. And if you click on the audio portion of the panel, oh, well, oh, how about the microphone? Everybody now is in mute mode and you will be in mute mode for the entirety of uh, the webinar. And so that's what that little icon is for. But if you click on the audio panel, you can select where your, your speakers or your headphone, how you go about hearing the webinar. And if you look below that will be the questions box. The questions box is how you can interact with our panelist and producer, Stephen. Stephen, say hi. Hello, everyone. And uh, you can ask us questions at any point in the webinar. And the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar will be for questions where we, and we will try to get most of those answered on the air. And we will uh, send you an email if, uh, if we're not able to get to your questions. So if you're looking, at the webinar on a tablet or mobile phone, something like this, your presentation should be something along the lines of this. You can see the microphone, you should be muted. And then the uh, little gear symbol where you can uh, adjust the audio. And then if you want to ask a question, there is the question mark there. And if uh, you can see if you have a, a message waiting for you, it'll be a little number above the people icon. Okay, so we're going to start with the poll and to test this interactivity. Stephen, let's roll the poll. And the question is, do you have a systematic VFR scan? Now, I wonder if folks are thinking like, if this is, is it, do we mean, obviously in IFR we think of scan, but this is an interesting idea to talk about the VFR scan. Well, you know, and so Chris, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chris Moser. Uh, I'm the Senior Director for uh, flight training education and I work for I work with schools and CFIs to help build out educational resources. And Pablo introduce yourself. So I'm Pablo Morelli I'm senior director of flight training technology and I'm doing anything that's related to technology within you can fly uh, working alongside these two guys uh, specifically uh, we're writing an app for in cockpit training and that's what uh, my that's what my goals are. Hey, real quick too, you gotta uh, talk about the um, wings credits. We don't have wings credits this week, but tune in next week where we have been approved for wings credit for watching this webinar. And so we're really excited about that because it is just about our number one question, isn't it, Pablo? It, it is the question, yes. <laughs> so not today, but next week. So that's a good incentive. And as I mentioned, my name is Keith West, and I am a flight instructor. And my job here at AOPA is to help flight schools develop better programs to be more profitable and to, to deliver a better flight training experience. Okay, so let's look. It looks like these numbers have stabilized on the poll. Go ahead and uh, let's uh, show the results there, Stephen. I actually find that quite surprising because <laughs> you know, most of the instruction I have had hasn't actually um, emphasized the VFR scan at all. What do you think, Chris? Well, one of the things I'm wondering here too is that you know, I wonder uh, how many of the folks out there have been flying for a while because I know that, at least for me, I, I think I told that story about um, I didn't learn how to do a proper visual outside flying until during my commercial training. Uh, and I just happened to get a CFI that was um, very into that. Whereas before that, I had gotten away with spending a lot of time looking, not that I didn't look outside, but I didn't have a really systematic way of doing it, the whole pitch attitude type of thing. And and so um, that's why I wonder what, how much experience, because I'm imagining the more experienced pilots we have on, the more likely they are to have already kind of developed that, probably just either through good instruction or maybe just you know figuring it out on their own. Right, okay, let's, um, let's kill those results, Stephen, and we will move on, there we go, okay. So we have already introduced ourselves here. So we will keep moving. Boy, we are 
making tracks today. Okay, so what we're going to re uh, what we're going to cover today is first how much can you see? And you know, we're going to talk just a little bit about human cognition and how much you know we as humans, what kind of processing ability do we have? And so we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about where you should be looking. And you know, the the information that I have always been given is just, oh, you should have a scan. But then we really it hasn't really been like described in greater detail to tell me precisely where to be looking in various phases of flight. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be going over six phases of flight and where uh, our suggestion is that you can look to have a, a scan during those uh, phases of flight. Like I mentioned as well, we will have questions at the end, roughly the last 10 to 15 minutes. And we will uh, talk about just briefly about next week's um, Don't Get Rusty and what we'll be uh, going over there. So what we are going to do right now is we are going to start our first video. We're gonna have four videos today. So it's an exciting um, program here. And we are going to let me select the first video and uh, just let me tell you, every time that we select this on this platform, we all go mute. And so I might start talking and not be muted. So somebody speak up, one, one of you guys, and tell me, hey, you're still muted. All right. So we're going <laughs> to roll the video right now. And let me tell you, too, there's going to be a poll right after this video, okay, uh, asking a question. So we will, um, we will see about that. Okay, here, the, my video went away. There, there it is. Okay, so let's click on that and let's start the video. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving too. the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. <laughs> it's kind of weird without When sound you're looking good. for a gorilla, yeah, <laughs> you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about Okay, there we go. And so we are going to launch right into a poll now. So Stephen, if you will uh, launch that poll. And of course, this one's going to be based on uh, watching the video the first time, not the second time. Yeah, or right. And so, audience. you know, we're, there's, there's, no, um, you know, there's no final exam score here. So we'll uh, just um, answer it honestly. And uh, we'll, we'll, it's kind of fun to see what people saw. How are we doing on that poll, Stephen? I gotta close down the video screen before I can launch it. Oh, Roger that. The invisible gorilla. Hmm. So I'm getting a lot of people asking that or saying that there's no video. Hmm. That they couldn't see it. Oh, that's not yeah, good. Um, GoToWebinar does have an issue with some platforms of video, and uh, it seems mostly to be with iPads. And so, if you would. Um, uh, let us know what type of device that you were accessing this by. That will that will help us as we try to uh, uh, try to refine this. Yeah, it does seem to be related to a lot of the you know if you're just on the browser, not the download. If you're on a certain device, uh, but the download seems to work best. So you mean like the uh, the go-to webinar download that? Uh, Correct. Yeah, the connector or something like that, yeah. isn't it? All right, so here we go. Yeah, we got the poll going. So I know I know when we watched this the first time when we were practicing this I did not see that gorilla. I was too busy trying to count the ball passes and I missed that. So uh I know Pablo you noticed it 
noticed you noticed the gorilla right away, but did you did you notice the people leaving or the the color no, changing? No, uh, no, I did see the gorilla. That was that was one of those where I was like, boy, I hope everyone saw the gorilla. Uh, but no, I did not see the the woman that left in the black shirt. That was man, I missed that completely. It's funny because I can remember going through it and thinking to myself, trying to focus on the ball because it was so confusing, and I and I can totally see when watching it the second time now where I would have being confused like the black shirts and everything where I wouldn't I was just trying literally trying to filter out black I was trying to focus on white and I'm sure that's why I missed the gorilla the first time all right well this is fun so let's go it looks like these numbers have stabilized Stephen so let's go ahead and show everyone the results of the poll Looks so like it, folks got the count and the gorilla yeah so it seems like almost everyone missed missed something right um but you know uh yeah they say usually about half the people miss the gorilla the first time i mean i missed, i saw this uh video several years ago and i missed it the first time as well so um all right well it's just it's just kind of a fun thing to show about how you could be paying really close attention to something and then miss something else that is entirely obvious um if you weren't absorbed in it so let's jump what does what does that mean to us let's see here well, the point they're trying to make is that you know humans aren't designed to fly airplanes. I hate to I hate to be the one to break you break <laughs> this to you, but and it's because that we have finite processing capability. And you saw it when you were trying to pay attention to how many ball passes were, or how many people um, missed that there you know something a gorilla goes walking through the screen and there's changing colors and people are leaving and all the other things are going on, and. It's really because that if you compare us to computers, we have we are much more limited. We have 10 million times less um, processing capability than the fastest of computers that are out there. And so, also the problem, the you know, why we're not designed to fly airplanes is that our minds are single-threaded. You can actually, I hate to break it to all of you know you multitasking people. Well, I, no, are you are you a multitasker? Oh my God, so much. Yeah, well, you, you're being you're being less effective, okay? Um, because yeah, I'm listening to you and answering questions, Mister. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we can only really concentrate on one thing at a time, but we do we are able to compensate um, with this on a, a couple different ways. One is time division, so you can take your attention and put it in different places in a sequential fashion, and then you're able to compensate somewhat or you're only really being able to focus on one thing at a time. Another way that we compensate is with experience because with experience, what we learn is what's important and where, what to pay attention to and where to look. And so that will kind of mitigate to some, ex, uh, to some extent that limitation of only being really able to concentrate on one thing. And you know, another thing that we use to compensate is we use tricks and crutches and so one of them chris and uh, i'm going to throw it to you just a second here describe one of your tricks and what we've talked about a number of times before and that's about having um a table or understanding of mm -hmm. like the power settings at different times when you're flying so that you don't have to you know pay a lot of attention to where you put your power and your airspeed and your attitude to get what it is you're looking for um so tell us tell us about what that is chris so one of the things that I, I've done, and I think it really, when I think back, it started during my student pilot training. My instructor had taught me just basic power settings for a 172, and the pattern is 2100 RPM. Cruising, we just did 2300, and I always thought, oh, that's the way you're supposed to fly it. When in reality, obviously, we have an almost, not quite infinite, but we have a lot of different variables that we could choose to use. But especially when I started teaching instruments to people, there you definitely want to have, you want to simplify as much as possible. You want to have, this is my power setting and my airspeed I'm going to use for straight and level. This is what I'm going to use for descents. This is what I'll use for climb. Um, and so I've now begun to formally teach that um, for people that are doing their initial pilot training as well, because I find that it just makes it easier. Find those basic power settings that you can use, not that you can't ever deviate from them, but it just makes your job a lot easier. So you're not having to think about what speed do I want? You just know ahead of time, I'm going to get the cruise and this is the power set I'm going to use and, and that's it. And in fact, the same was even true when I was flying um, stuff like the the uh, uh, Piper Chieftains and things like that before. And it was the same thing. We just had power settings we used and it makes it easier because otherwise you're just making it more complicated for yourself. So 
totally, totally. It, 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 it's great advice because if you if you have that in your mind, you're able just to dial in a power setting, then you don't have to pay a lot of attention. Remember, your attention is limited. Mm -hmm. You don't have to put attention on that. So where okay, so you have a finite amount of of attention. Where do you want to put it? You know, I hope you're going to recognize this pattern here. And so first is the aviation. So keeping the aircraft upright. You know, that's your number one priority. Then the navigation. Where is it that you're trying to go? You know, which way is the aircraft pointed? And finally, communication, talking on the radio. And so, of course, we've all heard that is aviate, navigate, communicate. And I honestly think that is some of the best advice in aviation. So aviate is first for a reason, right? It's it's the most important. And you need to, and the, the navigation, the navigate and the communicate, they have to be sandwiched in when the aviate is under control. Because if you're not able to keep the airplane upright, if you're not able to aviate the aircraft, then you're you're in trouble and you don't really have that attention span to be able to devote to the navigation and the communication. Well, so, and, and if I can add real quick is uh, mm -hmm. last week's excellent webinar. <laughs> uh, it did teach us that. that aviate, aviate is really, I mean, when it comes down to it, <laughs> that's that's the thing, man. That's that's the one thing to do. And if, if you haven't seen it, Go back and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Highly recommend it. It was a great webinar. Yes. Okay, so when is ABA <laughs> not under control? It's just before, during, and just after. Attitude changes. So when you're trying to point the aircraft in a different direction, or you're trying to, to hold it where you want it to be, and you're, you're struggling with that, then your aviation is not under control, and you're, you don't have any excess attention to be able to devote to anything else. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive deeper into what, where you should be looking to keep this AVA under control. And uh, first of all, we're going to launch a poll. And so, Stephen, let's roll this poll. And then Keith, when you mentioned attitude changes too, you mean not even just pitch, but you're talking pitch and like bank, right? Rolling as well. Yeah, you mean yeah. attitude is is pitch and bank. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Just yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we got here. Oh wow! Wow, this is overwhelming. Uh, it, yeah. it looks like some we're getting a little bit to swing to the uh, to the fun answer here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on. A lot of you are holding back. We've got like like maybe 30 percent who have voted right now. Let's everybody jump in and get the question here. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> they hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just moving now. <laughs> OK. All right, Stephen. Let's, well, let's let's let everybody enjoy these results. You know, that's, that's kind of the fun part of doing these webinars is we all get insight to, um, you know, a lot of people at one time. Uh, telling us what they think about something. So here it looks like almost all of us, it's, you know, ex except for um, Iceman there, you know, a few other <laughs> Top Gun types, at some point or another um, feel uh, overwhelmed when, when you're flying. I mean, Chris, have you ever felt overwhelmed? And you know what I was just thinking about that as, as you were talking about it is that, yes, absolutely, I felt overwhelmed. And I was trying to think, when does it happen? And honestly, it's either when if you get rusty, I can remember that feeling getting that. And also if it's someplace new. And so it's that whole idea of now I've got to pay attention to things and that's where it's easy to get overwhelmed because I'm in a situation, it's a new airport, whatever it might be. And, and so because I'm having to absorb more rather than already anticipating what's going to happen, well, I definitely new, get overwhelmed. Oh yeah, definitely. Me too. A new aircraft, a faster aircraft, you know, that's a perfect place to get. Oh over. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ne needing, uh, needing to keep up with your aircraft. Okay. Um, Stephen, let's go ahead and uh, kill those results. Okay, so now let's kind of think of it in a conceptual manner. You know, where is it that you want to spend your limited aviate attention? The you know the first part of it, keeping the aircraft upright. Well, this is just uh, some ideas that I came up with, and it seems like, of course, you know, you're going to focus on what's most important, right? Um, and what is most important? Well, it's that which must be maintained. And so let's say that you have been given a particular heading or a particular altitude. Um, you know, that's, that's what you have to maintain and that's what you're gonna focus on. Um, another thought is um, what's more likely to go wrong. And so, you know, we're gonna go over various phases of flight today. And, you know, one example of a place that might go wrong is you're, you're, you're in takeoff and you're rolling down the runway. So you, 
course, you must maintain that center line. And what's the most likely thing to go wrong is that you have a runway excursion. Somehow you run off the runway one side or, or the other, um, and which would obviously be a negative result. I mean, we want to avoid negative results. And so we think about, you know, what is the most likely negative thing that could go wrong here? And, uh, so when you're when you're right above the runway, what's the most negative result? Well, you could you could drop it in, right? So you're you're paying a lot of attention to to that attitude control and that sink rate there to be able to uh, work uh, tweak out that smooth landing. And then reaching a target. So let's say that you're you're in a turn, right? Well, what what the, what's the target? Well, you have a heading that you're going to roll out on. And, and, and if you think about it too, it, it varies during the course of your maneuver because let's say that you're gonna do a 360. You're, you roll into your turn, you do 270 degrees a turn, and for the most part, you can ignore the heading for almost all that time. But then you might give it a look that last uh, 90 degrees. And then when you get to the last you know, few percentage points, like the last 10% of that, of that turn, then you're gonna be paying a whole lot of attention because you're reaching a target. Same thing when you're reaching an altitude, either descending or, or climbing to an altitude. You know, if you've got 10,000 feet, 5,000 feet, whatever it is to go, you're not really paying any of attention to it. When you get within the last uh, um, 1,000 feet, the last 500, then the last three and 200, your, your attention is uh, shifting to that because you're reaching that target at something that's important. So let's, let's um, dial this in a little bit and look at what we might be thinking about in various phases of flight. And what we're gonna be going over today, first, we're gonna do a quick start sequence. You're starting your, you're starting your engine. What's the most important thing to be looking at then? Taxi, seems like a really simple one, so we'll go over that. We're gonna talk about takeoff, which is one of the, you know, we've got um, some video associated with that, and you'll see how quickly it happens and how quickly you have to pay attention to the different things that are important. We'll do a level off, a steep turn, which is, some, is a maneuver that gives a lot of people trouble. And one day, if you actually practice it, I know, okay, so you've got your certificate and you think, why would I need to practice a steep turn? Because it really does help to develop a feel for the aircraft and this ability to shift attention between a number of things that are, are moving kind of quick. And then um, it's really important to have a good pattern. So we're going to examine a base to final, uh, all the way to touchdown turn. Okay, so. Let's start the aircraft, okay? What's important when we're starting the aircraft? Well, I would say it, it, it varies, it, it changes a little bit as we go through the start sequence. But at first, the most important thing is you're gonna be turning the propeller or you know, uh, starting your jet. You wanna be sure that you're clear, right? That there, there's nothing in the way there, you know, of the propeller or nothing that you're gonna blast or anything like that. So that's the first important thing. And then the engine starts, and the next most important thing is, well, you don't want to be moving because you know you should always start the engine with your feet on the brakes, and you know, uh, the first thing you check is, am I moving, right? And then is the engine okay, right? So I'm I'm saying uh, suggesting that these are the you know, three most important things that you're considering during a start sequence, and so. What is the pattern that you want to go through to make sure that you're paying attention to these important things? Well. First, you look outside, right? You say clear, and when you when you say clear, you're not looking at the instrument panel or you know anything on your lap or anything like that. You're actually looking out to make sure that you are indeed clear. So then you start the engine. Uh, the next thing you might look at is the tack to to be sure that you get that RPM. Now, I, after you've flown a bit, you get you you'll have experience and you know from the sound of the engine that it's the right idle speed. But a quick glance at the tack is never the wrong thing to do to make sure that you that you got your right RPM. Then we look back outside again to make sure that we're not rolling. You can possibly do this with your peripheral vision, but you do want to consciously make that a, a check item to make sure that you, you're not gonna end up running into something um, after you've started developing thrust. Okay, so we want then we want to make sure that the engine is okay and we can look inside at the oil pressure and the amps to make, to make sure those are okay. Now this, the next thing is kind of one of my things more than anything, it's not, you could probably leave it out of your scan, but I would say turn on the avionics switch uh, to get those radios warming up so you can put your headset on and, and all those sorts of things. Now, then it's time, if you haven't already, to look at your checklist to make sure that everything here went as, uh, as you want it to. <clears throat> all right, so we're, move, we're moving out of the start phase and you know, it's time to taxi. So we're taxiing, what's the most important thing? That's pretty easy. Mostly you want to stay on the center line. 
you know, it, it, taxiing is actually a pretty high risk activity when you consider that any moment you're five seconds away from running off the taxiway. So the main thing is to maintain that center line. And secondary is your speed. And you should, you should be able to do that by, um, well, what our pattern is. And our pattern, what is it? It's totally outside. If you're taxiing, you know, I'm one of those guys saying, if you're taxiing, just taxi. You don't need to be fiddling with your, your GPS or, you know, your checklist or whatever it else that you're dealing with. You need to be looking outside and uh, focusing on what's important, and that's that center line and your speed. How's that sound, Chris? It does sound pretty good. And one thing that, uh, just to add in there, of course, part of that outside scan of also, of course, what you're doing is watching the center line, but you're watching for markings like a taxi hold short line or a hold short line uh, and other traffic. And um, and of course, then sometimes, of course, we should always not should be sometimes, but you know, we might sometimes get complacent maybe at our home airport, but especially at, at foreign airports, knowing having that airport diagrams. But it's all about that plan of having a plan of where I'm going, so I know where to look. And that discipline, like I agree with you totally, should not be programming anything, should not be fooling around with anything, but outside watching. And the only thing that I might look in at is to come in and check the um the airport diagram to see just to make sure that I'm making sure that I know where I am on the airport. And it's all about yeah, that. Again, I think a common theme is that plan of like, where do I look and what's happening? So I know what's coming next. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. Break check. Uh, the, Don't forget taxi. the break check. The almighty break check. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, hey. and you're, you're right. That is a, that is a procedure. And um, I, did, I didn't put every procedure in here, but um, you're right. You do, you do do that break check. Okay. Um, so Ben, Let's move along. So, you know, we've gotten, we've, we've completed our taxi and we are ready to take off. So as we talk about the takeoff, we're going to talk about that in a couple phases too, because your, your ground roll is one part of it. And then you wrote after the rotation, then that's another part. So initially, what are we looking at when we start that ground roll, when we start to take off? We want to stay on that center line. You know, what does the airplane want to do when you give it that full power? It wants to come off the center line, right? And so we, we want to be focused on that. Secondary is that everything is working. You know? So you know, we've given it full power, we're starting our acceleration, we're maintaining that center line, and then we wanna make sure that the, the engine is as we want it to be. And anything else, I mean, you, you hear a noise or something just doesn't seem right. You know, those are the things you're evaluating in those first few seconds of roll. Then there will be the rotation. And what's important there? Well, first of all, it's our attitude. And second of all is the track which means that you're maintaining that extended center line of the runway so that you're, you're not drifting off to the side one way or another. So what is our pattern then for making sure that we control what's important, that we're focusing our limited attention on what's important? Well, um, it's the, uh, the center line here, okay? And let me move the control panel over there. And so we're looking, we're looking outside, right? And so, hey, most so while you're looking outside, though, uh, sorry to interrupt. Would you, yeah. and Stephen Hopper asked this question, would you verify turn corner and compass while turning on the taxi, or or no? Yeah, I mean th that's a glance, and you know that's that's the the, uh, the the checklist of what you're doing. You know, we're we're talking mostly here about you know where you put your attention as you you know as you're performing these maneuvers, and there are certain checklist type things that you might need to accomplish. And so mostly you see that instrument check if you're doing a, an instrument related flight. A lot of BFR pilots haven't been exposed to that, but you know it's never a bad idea to just do a quick check of your instruments, and that takes off about three or four seconds. Okay, so we are we're on our takeoff here, and we're looking outside. You know, we're we're on our center line, um, and I I put this in here. It's almost like a procedural thing, but it is something that you have to devote um, a little slice of attention to, and that's your brakes, which means you want to be off your brakes. You want to put your heels on the floor because brakes do not help in takeoff. You're trying to accelerate, and so your, your brakes are a detriment in this case. And so then. Um, we're, we're rolling, and as we said, we're advancing the power smoothly, three to four seconds from um, idle all the way in, and we want to, we want to maintain that center line. Then we want to, we, like we said, we want to check to make sure that everything's okay. So we do a quick, quick glance in at the tack and oil pressure, and that's going to tell us if we're doing okay there. Then back to the center line. Now it keep, so I'm showing the flow back and forth, mm -hmm. and when we, uh, we we check the center line. 
and then we can check the airspeed. Now, I'm not going to go over however many times you do that, but it's just going to be a handful of times during this takeoff roll because, as we'll see in the video in just a second, it happens really fast. And Keith, um, just to just to clarify too, I'm just Roger, just to ask you, how long? Like, what would you say the breakdown so far as we're going through is? How much time are you spending when you're glancing in at the attack and oil pressure versus looking outside at the center line or like doing those outside references? Yeah, thanks What's for bringing that up. And, and just I'm gonna I, I I didn't really find any real data, but if you if you look about what um, what is recommended in instrument flights, experienced pilots spend about 80% of the time on the attitude indicator. And so I would say that the same applies in VFR flight. And so you should spend about 80% of your time looking outside, which for all intents and purposes is your attitude indicator. And so you're spending most of the time outside and it's just a quick glance in. And you know, and you're, you're not, your, your airspeed in a way, I know that will get pushed back on this, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, the airplane is gonna reach its flying speed when it when it reaches it and it's gonna take off, you know, pretty much on on its own if you're if you're holding the uh, the stick or the yoke where it needs to be. Um and you're then, saying we can't will the airspeed to happen by staring no, at it? it <laughs> You cannot. <laughs> Staring at it's not going to make. It's you know it's like um you know like you're you're waiting for the elevator and you want to keep pressing that button and the <laughs> idea that it's going to get there faster. No, that's not right. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and so then uh, when it's time to rotate, we look at the horizon and we rotate. So we have rotated now, and we're we're mostly looking at the horizon and we come in um, a couple of times for airspeed. And uh, then we take a look at the runway, and um, what we're looking at is to make sure that you're not drifting off one way or another. I know sometimes it can be difficult because the nose is cocked up, and you know where is the runway? You can glance out to the side, and if you don't see it, you you might be okay, assuming you haven't drifted off to the left. Or you can look at uh, something out in front of you, or some buildings, or structures, or fences, or whatever um, near the end of the runway. But basically, you want to confirm your track. And then take a look at your heading to see what heading is going to uh, give you the track you want, meaning the extended center line. Then we come, then we go back to the horizon and we can check the airspeed again. And um, the way these corrections are made too is like you learn this a lot in instrument flying mostly is that anytime you make a change in attitude, you're looking at your attitude indicator. And what is that for VFR flight? It's the horizon. So the changes that you make will be made outside on the horizon. And then you're coming in to just take a glance at your instruments to see what it gave you. If you need to make a, a counter or another correction, go back out to the horizon and then make your correction. All right, so let's take a look at um, the video here and see what. So the way the way this is uh, laid out is, is we're going to go through it twice because it happens so fast. And the first time will be for you just to take a look at it. And then the second time we will talk about it, look at it in a little bit more detail. Okay, pulling up the video here. Where do we see? Oh, it's buried under this screen. There we go. Okay, so let's break that down. So, you know, what, um, after uh, making this video, and this is uh, an X-Plane video, it just, it was kind of surprising to me how quickly that all happened, you know, so it's about 20, 25 seconds um, from 
from full power to that rotation. So you can see how quickly you, you don't have time for many iterations of that scan. So, you know, it's really important to focus on those, those handful of things that are important because you don't have a big bunch of time to uh, devote to other things. And I remember when I, um, um, I think I mentioned before that I, I flew for the Navy, you know, in my younger days. And so um, I've been flying jets for a while when I got into a faster jet, it was the A4 at the time. And that thing rotated at about 140. And so I remember the first few times I was flying, it felt like you, you advance the throttle, it hits the stop, it's time to rotate, you're taking off. You know, everything <laughs> happens just like that. But as you, as you got experience with it, things slowed down. And, you know, you had the leisure to look at your, um, you know, your, your I think the NGT or whatever it was at the time, to look at your instruments and then to watch your airspeed and know when it's time to rotate and, and that sort of thing. So um, as we mentioned before, it's, you know, experience is one of those things that help that help you slow down. What do you think about that, uh, that takeoff uh, process there, Chris? Uh, yeah, I mean, in fact, what I want, one of the things I was thinking about was a, a really good exercise, and I totally agree that you spend the majority of your time outside. And I really do, I even say that one of the things I, try to teach in a sense when I talk about this is look outside and when you're going to come back inside, know what you're going to look at. So before you even bother looking inside, you should already know I'm going to look at the airspeed indicator. So you come in, glance and back outside and a good exercise for not only this, but I'd say for everything that's coming up is that um, I will often take, because uh, back because I had it done to me as a student, but taking the instruments and covering them up with a piece of paper, work with the CFI, because even on the takeoff roll, other than, you know, you obviously want to check our engine instruments, even the airspeed, it's like, while I do check it, you can get away with, in a sense, you'll know when the airplane's ready to fly, not by yanking it off the ground, but just by a little bit of back pressure, it's going to take off when it takes off. And it's around 55 and then 172. But so I would say that really learning to focus outside what those pitch attitudes are that are going to give you the speeds and, and, and it's like, I think by covering that stuff up, to me, that seems to really solidify for people that it works because I don't know that they really believe it until you take all that away <laughs> and then they see how accurate you can fly by looking outside and knowing your pitch attitudes. No, exactly. That's that, you know, and that's a great comment. That's what I was uh, trying to convey that, you know, the airspeed when you're, when you're rolling down the runway, it doesn't matter that much because you don't really have any control over it. I mean, you've given it full power and it's going to get there, you know, when it gets there and there's nothing you can do about that. And so you're right. I, it's, I, if you just have just a little bit of back pressure as you know, you're doing that roll, it's going to lift off when it's ready to Go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, but, uh, first, uh, also, I was going to say in that case, because uh, someone just asked because they live in Colorado and they're like, "Well, it takes a little longer up here," uh, and <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's true. And I responded already with, um, "Yeah, uh, I had my first experience with the old density altitude uh, phenomena when I was first time there, taking off late afternoon, completely just." Forgot about it until I got to the end of that runway, and there's a, I think it was maybe a five foot wide by a three foot tall LED sign that says density altitude 9,300 feet. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. well, let's and use all 9,000 feet of this runway. And, and to that point, Pablo, one of the caveats I was going to say about, you know, it's like I know that we both, Keith and I, were talking about the fact that you really can do it without it. That doesn't mean I don't check it. And the reason is for that, because we do want to know when is it not performing the way that it should. And in the case of density altitude, or even a normal, like a shorter runway or whatever, it's good to know, like I should know my airspeed should be, like I should have my, my abort point. Um, it's that idea of when am I gonna, if I don't reach a certain airspeed by this point, I'm gonna abort because something's not right. And of yeah. course in the density altitude, that's, that's key. So it's not that we don't check it, but the, I think the Keith and I are trying to get at is, you don't need to stare at it to make that happen. It's gotta be quick glances in, focus outside. Okay, so real quick, I'd like to just uh, quick PSA. Uh, a lot of people are reporting that the videos are freezing, not showing, or issue of some kind. Uh, we've we know that in the recordings, all of this uh, does show. Um, so when you guys get the link, uh, you should be able to see everything because it's a recording of what we're doing from the go to webinar home office or whatever. So. If you had issues, if, when you go to that link, you should be able to see this uninterrupted. And I say should because it's still a go-to webinar. And do let us know because, we, like I said, we are tracking the yeah. uh, our platforms here to know what Absolutely. best to Absolutely. use them. And reporting okay. things to them too. So. Yeah. All right. So uh, we've we've let's talk about level off. Okay. So uh, what's important you know, in in this case, and it's our uh, it's our 
it's our altitude, right? Because we uh, presumably are leveling off at a particular altitude. And then uh, secondary, we're talking about our power setting. So what is the pattern? You know, so we're, we're, we're just about to level off. And let's just say we're, that we're leveling off from a climb. We look outside and we, uh, we're, we're approaching the altitude that we want. And then we push over to, uh, to get to that level attitude. And it's something that we have in our mind about, you know, something rough about what level uh, will be for us. Then we come in and we take a look. We took a look at the altimeter to make sure that we got to the altitude that we're looking for. And then I would say that the, you also take a look at the VSI too, because if, even if you're on that altitude, if your VSI is not at zero, you're not gonna be on that, um, on that altitude for very long. And I'm just gonna throw out a little bit. I think um, the VSI is a greatly underutilized instrument as far as um, VFR flight goes. You, you use, uh, instrument pilots tend to use it um, a lot more, but it, it's not so much to show you what is happening right now, but showing you what's gonna happen. Because before your um, your altimeter can ever move, your VSI will move first, and so it will kind of, it can show you it's basically a, a window to the future. So we've uh, we've looked in at our altimeter and VSI, and then then we go back outside to make any adjustments. Say that our VSI was still showing a climb or descent, we we look outside and we make an adjustment with our attitude or pitch um, to uh, to counteract whatever it was we're seeing. And then it's to the tack, okay? And mostly, um, like I mentioned before, you can quite often do this a really close cut just on sound. You just pull it to where you think it might need to be. And then you can take a look at it to make sure it's the power setting that you want because you know what power setting you want. Say you're gonna be in cruise flight, you know, like in a Skyhawk or something like that, maybe it's 23, 2400 RPM, something like that. Okay, so level off, I, that was pretty easy, don't you think, Chris? Yeah, <laughs> not too bad. And I think the big thing there is, again, is that idea of the anticipation when it's coming. I was just going to make the comment of it's the, it's like you were talking about when to when to look. And it's like when you're a thousand feet still to go, you got some time and you start to you start to figure that out knowing the airplane. Of course, um, you know, it's like it depends if you're in a jet thousand feet might not be a whole lot. But, you know, 172, you got some time. But then you start to notice, oh, I've got 300 feet to go now. Now I got to start paying attention because it's coming up relatively shortly. So I increase my scan when I know that's coming. Okay, good. All right, let's go on to steep turns. So, now, uh, uh, so real quick, someone someone just asked about a checklist. Uh, when does that come in after takeoff? Um, or when well, should after, it come in? Um, okay, so you've taken off. Your your next checklist is probably going to be your uh, your cruise or your level off checklist. And so, you know, we're we're talking here about you know the aviate part to get everything you know, the way the way it needs to be, and then you bring up your checklist. And you can uh, you, you you go over that after. And so right after I would level off, like after that last one I had there, but you got your power setting right. Then it's time to pull off the checklist and see what else you might need to do. And I would just add, and maybe it's the I do that when things are stabilized, as you mentioned, when things are stabilized in the climb, whatever I'm doing, because I sometimes I see climb checklists as well. Get it stabilized. I do a quick flow, and then I'll do the checklist while things are stabilized, because that when I means I have time to look. Things aren't changing. Okay. All right, so steep turn. Now, don't just because you've gotten your certificate doesn't mean that you should give up on steep turns. Maybe if you if you've got a private, well, you know, if you're going to do commercial, you're going to do it again at a little bit a steeper angle of bank. Um, and it, like I mentioned before, it's a great way to keep your skills up. I mean, I go up, and if I don't have anything else to do, I'll do a couple steep turns because you know they're challenging uh, always to do well. Um, what's most important? Well, I think. Probably number one is to be able to uh, to maintain your altitude, also uh, your angle of bank, because you know those are the two primary factors that's 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 going to be changing a lot and that you need to uh, to pay attention to. And then second of all, uh, your coordination, you know, is is the ball in the center. Um, what's the pattern for that? Oh, look here, outside again. See how important it is to look outside. We can't overemphasize that enough. So, the, so here's the, here's what you're doing. You roll into your steep turn. You take a look outside and get it about where you think it should be. Then come in and take a look at your VSI to make sure that you're not going up or down, and your attitude to check that angle of bank. Because if you're doing it to the private pilot standards, you're looking for 45 degrees angle of bank, and you can get kind of close just by eyeballing it, looking outside. But you refine it by looking at your attitude indicator. Then go back outside. 
then come back in and take a look again at your uh, your VSI and this time your altimeter to make sure that uh, you, you're, you haven't moved off the altitude that you're looking for. Then outside because you're outside most of the time and this is then you, you can look the next time you come in you might just take a glance at your airspeed. I'm not a huge fan of paying a lot of attention to your airspeed because as, as long as you have your power setting right and you're not going up or down you're you're not going to have to pay a whole lot of attention to your airspeed and so to me this uh this pattern is just kind of showing like the the weight of you know the instruments that you look at okay we have another video so let's take a look at this one and deep turn and uh if you're if you're looking at it on a an ipad or something like that i've been told that if you will swipe that possibly um that will help you take a look at it now um if, it, it, I don't know if, um, if you want to throw in your comments to try to guess where this is. I know that's kind of a hard question, but we, we're going to have a prize for guessing where one of these videos is in just a little bit. Okay. Sweet. But I'm going to be the first one to guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hang, ar hang around for the prize. Okay. So let's... Keith, you want to maybe narrate for the folks that can't see it as just describe what's happening? Okay, so, uh, so we're in a steep turn here, and if you're, if you're taking a look, you see those two arrows, there's a little, I don't know if you can see it, but a little dot on the screen in front of us that, uh, that you can take a look at. It. Really, it's important to have that, that reference. Then, so we're looking at our um, altitude, looking at our attitude again, and then to our, our VSI. So it's looking good, so we're feeling pretty good. We're looking outside, you know, about 80% of the time, just coming in to glance every once in a while at our engine. Attitude, and here we are. We reach our outside reference, and we roll the other way. Check our angle of bank to make sure we've got the right angle of bank. It's looking good. Now we'll take a quick look at our BSI and its level, and here we are back at our attitude. See, if we maintain that attitude, we're seeing that it, you know, we're not getting too far out of parameters with either our altitude. And our airspeed's down. You know, we're not doing. We're not paying attention to that at all. Again, taking a look at the altitude. So basically, in and out, attitude, VSI. You know, because if your VSI is not deflected, your altimeter is not going anywhere either. Oh, here it is. Time to reverse. All right, so let's end this one. And we'll show the screen. So what do you think about that one, Chris? I mean, but do you find that um, steep turns are one of the more challenging? Uh, it, maneuvers to fly yeah especially because it seems like they're when you're in the training part they get to the point of being simple but then it's definitely one of the things if you don't practice them you go back to do them again they're way more they're way harder than you thought um but the big thing that I, i'm taking away from watching all of these is that it's the idea is that when you learn what that picture is and you can learn how to adjust it outside and know what it's supposed to look like all of a sudden everything inside behaves Whereas if you're trying to spend a lot of time making these adjustments, looking inside, it is so much more difficult. So it's that, that's why I, again, I'll reiterate that idea of cover the instruments up, like get the idea of where it's supposed to be, cover them up and you're gonna find, you're gonna hold altitude a lot better. Everything's gonna stay, stay so much better behaved when you figure out what that picture is outside and adjust there. Totally, entirely. Okay, so let's go to our, our final maneuver here, which is uh, base the final all the way to touchdown. Okay, so what is important? Um, First of all, it's your position relative to the runway. And so uh, when I'm teaching students, and uh, from basically from the time you're a beam, you should not be looking at your instruments hardly at all. It's This is almost, it's an easier scan than most of the other ones because it's mostly outside. The other thing that's important is your airspeed, okay? And then when we get on final to, to refine this just a little bit more, once again, we're mostly outside and uh, this time position relative to the runway, let's, uh, define it farther, further, and that's line up and glide slope. So there's only three things that matter when you're on final. It's your line up, it's your glide slope, and it's your airspeed. So what's the pattern for that? We're outside. When we come in and we look at our airspeed, we're outside again. We can look at our VSI every once in a while because that will tell you if you're going to be able to maintain your glide slope. Outside, airspeed. So we're like you saw, most of the time you're outside with a couple glances at the instrument. So we're going to take a look at this video. Now, this video is at a particular airport, okay? And so the first person who um, puts into the uh, to the question to the chat, 
we'll we'll send you something okay we'll we'll collect your address or whatever and um we'll have a little prize here so where is this for one thing but we will go over here so let we've me had go. a couple of guesses already uh it's not no 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 not before <laughs> we'll not until right when i hit that play button or we're going to accept <laughs> nice try though okay here we go We're going to do this twice. The first time is just so that you can get a sense for, for the maneuver, and then we're going to do it a second time where um, where we're going over what the scan will be. And so this is no flap, and we're, we're just turning final right now, and we see we've got a little bit of an over here, and so we want to correct that. We get our wings level. And so being visible 172 and being no flaps, uh, we want to be about 70 knots right at the end of the final. Just a little bit fast here, slowing down. And possibly a little bit high, but we got, we got we have plenty of runway. Take a look at our VSI, we got a good glide slope too. You know, uh, at the speeds of typical trainers fly at something around 500 feet of events, which you should be looking for a uh, base on the way. Now we're just trying to maintain that center line, hold it off here, touch down, and we're drifting just a little bit left. I'll take that touch down. So now we want to get it back on the center line. All right. Now we're now we're going to do it again, and we're going to take a look in greater detail exactly where we should be looking. Okay, looking on the side. Airspeed and then attitude. Outside again. Quick look at the VSI. And all this time that we're meeting an attitude. A lot of people want to drop their nose in a turn. We want to maintain that. Take a quick look at your airspeed. So see it's basically your your airspeed and your attitude. And you know, if you, if, I'm a big fan of trimming correctly because if you trim correctly, your airbeam's going to mostly maintain the dome. Look at the quick look at the airspeed. Now it's all outside. Line up the glide stuff. Maybe one more look at your, your airspeed at the top of the flare so you know how much energy you have and what type of wear that you have to do. There you go. And so now it's entirely outside. There's no reason to be looking at your instruments now. You're holding that center line, you're holding that pitch where you want it. And then we got a touchdown, okay? And so there's a, there's a good discussion to be had. We really don't have time today about where you should be looking at the flare. I mean, you can see over the, uh, the nose, that's good. But I tend to like looking over in this left-hand uh, corner as well, looking out that left-hand side, because that gives you um, a good idea of where you need to be. Okay. Um, we have a winner. We okay. Until where, Pablo? Where was that? Well, just by memory alone, because I know this. Uh, that was Oshkosh. <laughs> and based on our comments and questions here, the first person, because we had a lot of winners. Uh, well, not winners. We had a lot of people with the correct answer, but the first one that came up with Oshkosh was Greg Holland. Congratulations, Greg Holland. Good job, Greg. Great job, Greg. All right, and so uh, and, you know we we were all sad. Um, because of you know circumstances well known that we won't be having um, Air Venture this year, and we want to you know reach out to our friends at EAA, and we're sorry for that, and you know support our sister organization and uh, maintain your membership for over the course of the year, and look forward to next year us all being able to get to Oshkosh. Okay, so it's time for questions. Pablo, do we have any questions? Well, listen, I'm trying to find some, and uh, apparently you're just that good. But I jest. So uh, many statements. Uh, I would say more statements than questions, actually. Uh, but we always get these, right? Every week we get these. So let me start with this. We did have some people telling us uh, that they aren't getting emails afterwards with the links. So I'll apologize for GoToWebinar in that case. So what I'm going to do right now is in the chat box, I am going to put in the link or you can see our videos. So three, two, one.
boom, there it is. And those right. videos won't be available for about three hours. It takes GoToWebinar about that time to uh, to process the videos. So it's going to be several hours from now before they will be available. And another disclaimer is this link here is uh, within our AOPA. And they are putting, the, we got a late start on actually putting them on our site, which is funny because it's AOPA and it's us. However, uh, right now I believe there's three up there. And I think every day they're going to add one until we catch up and this is number six so I, I believe there's three Stephen right up there now uh, so four should be today and then it'll be another two days so by Monday this one that you're watching will be up but you know if, if you want to binge watch us hey we're gonna <laughs> four, five, right AOP Netflix so uh, so there they are and um, so that's that's answered there. And I hope if anyone can't see it, let me know. But I did put it in there, uh, so it should be up there. Uh, so Kevin says the link disappeared three seconds flat. You probably and, scroll. Yeah. Check your scroll. You'll have to yeah, scroll. That, it's definitely it. there because they don't go away. It's in the chat, uh, and it does start with uh, AOPA.org and then a bunch of slashes. So please take another look there. If not, I can re-put it in there. Yeah, if you scroll um, up and down, you'll be able to find it. Okay, so here's another one. So any helpful scans for finding traffic on all phases? You know, that's a really good question. I didn't put that in here uh, due to a, a lack of time, but, um, and, you know, we're basically talking about the aviate portion of controlling your aircraft, but the, it's it's really true. It's kind of funny because I got a couple ants uh, walking around the floor here. And the reason I mentioned that is because I was looking at them earlier. And if I just look in general at the floor, I can't see those tiny little ants. But if I focus in discrete portions of the floor, then you can see it. Okay, so it's the same thing with your flying. And the, the FAA talks about a scan of about 10 to 15 degree sectors at a time. So look 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 and moving you have to focus because an airplane once you get outside of about three miles is not much more than a dot and so you really have to focus in various um, areas to be able to see it do you have any um, anything to add to that chris that's honestly the biggest thing um, and it's also i guess on the flip side of that it's something to be aware of to help other people see you i purposely will make radio calls like in a non-towered pattern when i'm turning because those wings when they're flashed up or way easier to see them when you're trailing behind somebody it's almost impossible to find them behind the Good background point. clutter and everything. oh yeah totally totally all right what else okay. we got pablo yeah so frank's asking i uh, saw a video where power was added in a steep turn to stop a descent your thoughts well it, when you start playing with the power it, 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 it's hard to find that position again where you need to be okay i would correct the, the descent with an attitude change. And uh, some people say pull back more, that's okay. I personally take a few degrees angle of bank out and it will come back up where it needs mm -hmm. to be and then put the angle of bank in. But I would I would avoid messing with my power to, to try to straighten things out. What do you think, Chris? Uh, I would say the same, uh, the two things, and I have one other comment to make after this, not related, but uh, one of the things I would say is that if, you've lost enough altitude that you're now needing to add power potentially, then you probably kind of screwed up too much. And so it's probably better to maybe start over and make those, get that pitch attitude down so that doesn't happen. You know, unless you're dealing with some kind of crazy turbulence maybe. Um, the one thing I wanted to note sort of unrelated is a couple questions ago. I just tested it really quick. If you also just Google AOPA webinars, it comes up right away on the Google thing. It's the right website. So that's a fast way to find that too. Yeah, cool. or you could just use the link I sent you. Yes, you can, just in case they okay. can't find it. All right, if you want to be, you know, more macro level, sure. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, I want to combine these two questions. It's both on steep turns. One person asked, um, do you trim or just muscle it? And the other person said, are there secrets to doing, uh, maintaining altitude during a steep turn? What do you do with the elevator? So. Let me take this one, okay? Because the if you're, if you're going for a check ride, the easiest way to do it is to like if you're in a skyhawk it's two full turns of the trim wheel you know it's basically a half 360. do that twice and the thing is just going to float around kind of like magic and you're not going to have to wrestle it okay i don't think that actually teaches you a lot of what it is that you need to learn because you want to learn how to control the attitude of the aircraft so once you get past your check ride you know it's up to you to make yourself better so go out and practice this without doing that trim tr trick and actually control the attitude of the aircraft and you're gonna become a lot better over time. What do you think, Chris? I totally agree. I think that I think that you know muscling quote unquote through it is 
it's really teaching you that pitch attitude part. It's teaching you the pressures that are in there. And that's really what you're supposed to be learning to make you a better stick and rudder pilot, which I think is important. But I know I've, I've played with the trim thing too. It does make it way easier. But again, I agree that I think it does take away from what we're supposed to be learning. Yeah. What else we got, okay. Pablo? Yeah, so any tips on developing a consistent stabilized approach? That is another webinar that we really have. <laughs> but quite honestly, it's about having your power set where you need to be in your trim. If you get your power in your trim where it needs to be, it's going to be pretty small corrections after that. And But we are going to have, um, I, I hope, I plan an entire webinar just on how to do that stabilized approach because it's a, it's a bigger topic. Okay. Um, so people are asking about the link again. Um, maybe we can put it on. It, you will slides. get an email with a link to the webinar, and that'll be the fastest way that you can find well, it. Well, there's people are saying they don't get the link, the email, though. That's the problem. Uh, okay. So I don't know what that's about, but we'll have to look at it. Well, we, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Reminder, folks, have to look in the chat here to actually see the chat. That wasn't me. That was someone on the chat. Okay. Uh, so let me put a couple of comments in here. Someone says, prior to entering the runway, I do a scan of the airport airspace. Hmm. In an uncontrolled field, I also do a 360 turn to do this. So, you know, agree, disagree. This was this Chris, was early yeah, on, really yeah. early on. Yeah, yeah, I d yeah, obviously scanning for traffic outside is a great idea all the time. Um, not even just a great idea. It's really something you, you should really need to be doing. Not even yeah. a want, but a need. Uh, the 360, <laughs> I was just talking to somebody about this recently, and it, I th I'd say it's based on, do you have enough room? I mean, if you're in a busy run-up area and there's no room to do the 360, it's kind of difficult. If you have the room and you think it's worthwhile and it helps you see everything, then there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, I, I don't do that 360. and um, Because, I mean, if you can look out and you can see what's on final, you know, it's not like you're going to have a helicopter or something dropping, you know, directly from above or something like that. So you, you need to be able to see the final approach course and that, that whatever it takes to do that you know i would say cool. all right anything else okay yeah uh so there's a couple of um well, we're doing pretty good on the time actually all right so this is a comment as well uh that i i believe will probably cause us to discuss when the atc is talking fast and giving three four five step instructions why am i on final for a touch and go in instrument practice it's pretty specific that gets my brain overloaded. I just ignore them for one minute and ask for repeat, say again. Sometimes I get pissed off. Most are very pleasant about it. That seems aviate first. Yeah. But uh, I don't, I mean, I am not instrument rated. However, I would say that waiting one minute to say, say again is a long time. I mean, one minute is a long, I could see a hesitation. I don't know what you guys think, but one minute. Like if we sat here in silence for one minute, that's a long time. Well, I tell yeah. you what, a missed approach is one of the most hairy times that, that that you have. I mean, because you're you know you're shifting from this expectation to land to going full power, and if you got a high powered aircraft, it's it's kind of hard to control. And so I would say that you're right to fly the airplane first. I mean, keep it upright, get it going away from the ground. Um, before you worry about that. I think uh, most controllers are pretty good about not giving you instructions about, you know, high workload type of times. But, you know, if you do get them, um, that the, the, the advice is eternal, aviate, navigate, communicate. And you could even maybe throw in if you had to a, a standby or any mm -hmm. other part I would get out there too, is that in that sense, if, if I want, I you know, of course we don't know the situation, but I'm wondering if, if it's really that maybe it's more, practice and getting efficient with what you're looking at and what you're doing, getting your procedures nailed down so you're not feeling, because if you can anticipate and get things done early, you tend to feel a little less overloaded in that situation. So maybe there's some um, things you could do there to improve that. And then if it is just a case of a controller, because we have we have a controller at our airport that I drives me nuts with student pilots that will give taxi instructions while we're rolling out. And I hate that. And I just tell oh. the student pilots, like, ignore it and wait to get clear and then call them back. I said, because it's even though, you know, I can do that because I'm sitting over there and I'm not the one rolling out and I can call them back or whatever. Um, that drives me nuts. And I really feel like, you know, in that case, the controllers, and, and I've asked, it's like, please don't do that because it's just too much at that point. And it's right. I, I got it, wrecking the airplane is not, the excuse can't be, I was trying to call back the controller. So that's going to be on you. Okay. Um, we, I am going to uh, roll to the last slide here. 
and this is the official end of the webinar, but um, if you want to hang around, we'll answer uh, some more questions as long as people keep asking the questions and we have the time. But um, we really enjoy doing these webinars and we hope that you're getting something out of it. And so we hope you join us next week and our, the title will be Knocking Off the Rust, What Could Go Wrong? And we're gonna be joined by um, uh, Pat Brown. He's our ambassador in Texas and he's a, a, he's a great presenter, a DPE. And so we're really looking forward uh, to the program next week and we, we hope that you will join in. Um, but we will stick around and uh, answer some more questions. Um, do we have any more questions, Pablo? Oh, we do. And, and, <laughs> and I was getting to this one before is it's a, it's a classic. What was your setup on X-Plane? <laughs> <laughs> Set up on um, like computer wise, um, you know, running a uh, what is it? Uh, it's an i buy power computer, but it's an i7, and it does you do, you do have to have a dedicated graphics card, so it's an NVIDIA graphics card, and it's uh, you know a fairly a fairly recent one. It's not the most expensive, latest and greatest one, but if you have a computer that's maybe two to three years old, um, well you know zero to three years old, let's say, with a dedicated graphics card, then you'll be able to run Xplain because I have tried to run Xplain on slower, older computers and it just does not work. So uh, dedicated graphics card and as much RAM as you can shove in there would be my recommendation. Cool. And then joystick wise, you have just the, the one joystick, nothing else? I just have a an old, gosh, it's, I don't know, 10 years old Microsoft joystick. You know, I don't have uh, the yoke or anything like that I, because I really don't find any differentiation between uh, a yoke and a joystick. And a joystick is just much more, it doesn't get in the way. And so if you actually need to use a computer for a computer, you don't have to take anything <laughs> off the desk and move stuff around. So I just use a joystick. Cool. All right. So here's another one. Um, it's, it's again, it's a comment, but uh, I will start with the disclaimer that I did my check ride in a warrior. I didn't do a lot of my training and I did an archer actually, but I figured the warrior was more docile for the test. So uh, I've got a warrior. I was out trying to do accelerate stalls about 110 knots, which I have to laugh at 110 in a warrior. That's why I had to start with the disclaimer. <laughs> I did one too. I don't think it ever got to 110 other than downhill with a tailwind. So. Good for you, Kevin. <laughs> Controls were really heavy. Actually, couldn't do it until I slowed down to about 90 knots. So that is the statement. I just wanted to point it out. If you guys have comments on that, because I really found the 110 in a warrior to be fantastic. So I'm wondering, <laughs> what's do you know what the maneuvering speed is in that one? Do you remember it all? Oof. It's it's not very much. I mean, it's been probably six, seven years since I've flown in a yeah. warrior. It's probably yeah. somewhere a little, I would think it's a little bit under 110, but you know, if you're doing accelerated stalls, you want to be um, below maneuvering speed. Yeah, because you're going to be putting some stress on the airframe. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I'm almost wondering, because like, it's, maybe it's the point you were going, you were at such a low angle of attack trying to do them that maybe there wasn't enough control authority to pull it into it. But again, I would definitely caution, be below maneuvering speed, because you're going to put stress on the airframe and you don't want to damage it or yourself. Cool. All right, uh, let's keep going here. So we've got um, uh, somebody early on said they want to check for abort points uh, to your outside checklist. Uh, yeah, and you know, uh, the, this is for a, a, a training aircraft and, you know, the most simple um, presentation because, you know, it, my whole, one of my philosophies as far as the flight training goes is that people in the initial phases, especially, and people who don't fly a lot, they're easily overwhelmed. And so what is it that you can do to make it as simple as possible? And so if you're flying a higher performance aircraft, if you're flying on a shorter runway, you know, it makes sense to have abort uh, procedures um, or ideas about when you're going to abort. I think quite often you, you know when the airplane doesn't have as much thrust as it usually does so you're gonna you're gonna kind of sense it but the whole point of this presentation is not to say this is everything that you should be doing it's to say these are the most important things that you need to concentrate on once you get these under control then you can add flourishes and other type things to pay attention to um, as you fly and then one thing just to, to throw in there with that a relatively simple one that i know that our, our air safety institute talks about a lot is the 50 70 rule where you want to reach 70 percent of your um, rotation speed or takeoff speed, yeah, rotation speed basically by halfway down the runway. And so you could, what you could do potentially is figure out for your airplane, well, what's the halfway point of the runway? So have a physical point. Like I know for us, it's a lot of times it's the VOR on um, runway two, three. 
and then know what speed that is. So it's like, I want to be at 55 or whatever, or, or maybe my climb up of VY um, by that point. And if I'm not, then I know it's time to abort. And I agree with you. You can kind of tell, you know what the airplane's doing. And when you're first starting, you're going to have a CFI with you anyway, that's going to know this. Um, but if it's not acting properly, then it's time to abort. Anything weird, rather get it done on the ground, not not be dealing with it in the air. All right. All right. Uh, when you're drifting on the runway, when landing, how is the best way to correct that? Once you're already on the runway, it would be with your rudder. Uh, I, I read them as they come in, sir. When yep. you're drifting on the runway, when landing, how is the best way to correct that? My guess is they're saying right before touchdown. Okay, so right before touchdown, you're going to lower the wing one one way or another to counteract mm -hmm. the drift. And if you if you touch down and you're drifting when you're actually on the pavement, it's because you were drifting before you touch down. Um, but once you once you get the wheels on the pavement, you're steering with your rudder. And so okay. just and the main thing is just to be you know first of all stop the drift. Don't try to dart for the center line. You know, be very deliberate and controlled. So uh, a little bit of rudder, you know, opposite your drift. Stop the drift, and then you can kind of drift it back to the center line. And of course, the two things I would say there too is that one, it's like it's likely a crosswind causing this, is what I'm guessing. And so in that case, a really good way if you're not as proficient um, as you want to be, or you're a little nervous about crosswinds, try doing low approaches as well on the crosswinds, because that will help you learn those controls, because it is really counterintuitive to put an aileron into the wind and rudder opposite that to maintain your alignment with the runway. Uh, and then the other part is be careful, just like Keith was saying, I just want to emphasize or reiterate that when you're applying those rudders on that rollout, especially in a tricycle gear, I have seen it happen where people push too hard, too fast, and I felt it come up with that one wheel come off the ground because it's like a tricycle bike. It will flip over. Um, so really just be, you, you want to be enough that you're being, don't let it go off the runway, control the airplane, but don't jam on it either. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then we've got, uh, hold on, I just lost it. Oh, so we've gotten this a couple times now throughout, uh, and we just got one right now, which is where do we register for next week's webinar? There will be a link in the email. <laughs> so well, what if, you know, this is your first time here. Let's say you found it on accident. How would you find it? Um, it will be on, it's, it's, a, it just, it's on the AOPA webinars page, which is under the Pilot Information Center. Is it in the events calendar too? It's in the events calendar, yes. Okay. And then at Facebook as well, we post them on Facebook, I know. We, we do post them on Facebook and we, we are sending out emails letting, pe letting people know about this. But we are about to solve that problem. Once you register for future webinars, you'll be registered for subsequent ones as well. And so um, bear with us one more week and we'll get that under control. All right. So I think probably one last one is, can I ask my CFI to cover an instrument to help with finding reference outside? Steep turn and horizon. What do you think, Chris? Cover them all. That's what I say. And in fact, yeah, you're CFI. In fact, a really, uh, what I love to do is you take a little piece of tape with a big piece of paper and f cover all, the whole six pack up, or if you're using a glass panel, cover up the appropriate things. And then what your CFI can do, what I'll often do is I'll say, you tell me when you want to look at something and I will flip it up, let them look and put it back down. And that way it really forces you to only figure out what am I going to look at? quickly glance at it and get back outside. <clears throat> That's a, a great, great way to learn that. And trust me, the confidence that you will build in figuring out that I can fly by looking outside is, to me, it's magical, honestly. It's really cool to see. I, I love the process of seeing people learn that. All right. What he said. All right. Are we, are we, are we uh... <laughs> yeah, we're pretty much out of them. I mean, there's there's other questions about uh, like where and stuff. So somebody says that when they got the email, it actually said, "Sorry, we missed you." <laughs> and so that, so he he wants to make sure that he gets counted for wings uh, starting next week. So uh, I yeah, actually am responding right now. Yeah. Yes, I, I said uh, you stumped me. I we don't know about we haven't heard about that. Uh, literally, Phil's the first person that said that they got something that said, "Sorry, we missed you." Um, so, if, if somebody doesn't attend, they get a, um, you know, a sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry you weren't able to make it, but there's still the same links as the other one as well. Like a, maybe an auto trigger from like if you don't get in right away when it starts or something. 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but you know, go to webinar sends a different email to the people who showed up and who didn't show up. But we're sending the same information to both categories. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I enjoyed it. it. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and uh, you know, uh, we we love to hear from you, and so uh, you can reply to any of those emails that you got, and we will be happy to uh, respond. Hold on. Hold on, one last one. So somebody says on Facebook, simply AOPA or some subset. It's on AOPA, uh, or yeah. is it AOPA Live? It's the it's the AOPA uh, page. Yeah, the fa the main Facebook AOPA page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it says fly with AOPA or something maybe on there too when you go to that site or that page. Okay. All right, great. All right, thanks again, everyone. Cool. And, Thank uh, you, everybody. Huh. Cool. Have a good one. Right. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.